All right. Uh, is this a appropriate distance? Everybody can hear me fine? Perfect. Uh, yeah, so this is Free Your Mind, Battling Our Biases. Uh, I'm Dade. I'm a staff security engineer. I don't know if my slides moved, so just somebody thumbs up. Perfect. All right. Uh, I'm a staff security engineer for a fintech startup, uh, independent security consultant on the side. I have a background in red team work at companies like Oracle and Intel, which will be a little bit relevant later on. Uh, and if you're interested in more about me, you can find basically all my links at zerexda.de. Uh, quick disclaimer, uh, this is not a technical talk. If you're here for the latest buffer overflow in a poorly written C program, this is not the place for you. Uh, this is a talk about biases, the unexpected benefits of being a beginner, and changing the way we interact with our colleagues and peers. And now I have to actually look at my slides. Cool, now we are where we're supposed to be. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a brief informal survey. I'm going to ask a couple questions, and I just want you to raise your hand if the question applies to you. Uh, have you recently done something that you later thought was dumb? Have you recently refrained from asking a question because you were afraid people would think you were dumb? Have you recently been annoyed when someone asked a question that you thought that they should know the answer to? And have you recently refrained from sharing a piece of information because you assumed that everyone already knew it? Uh, it looks like we're all somewhat aware of our own biases at this point, so that's great. Uh, I, I tried to pick some that were more likely to be common in more experienced people as well as people uh, like who are more beginners are going to feel things. So uh, I'd like to start off by talking to the beginners in the room, uh, the people who are new to the industry or even just new to their current job. We're going to ha discuss some common feelings and how they can be associated with various cognitive biases, and then we'll chat with the more experienced folks, and we'll end with a technique that I think can help us all battle our biases more easily. Uh, we're only going to take a surface look at most of these because I had the audacity to submit this as a 20-minute talk before I started writing it. Uh, hopefully it's enough that if you're interested, you can go look them up yourselves. Uh, I personally found a lot of value in understanding that several things that I felt and things that I believed were common enough that they uh, not only had names, but they also had Wikipedia pages. So uh, I wanted to start with this phrase, always be the dumbest person in the room. Uh, I got this advice a lot when I was younger, and I think a lot of business guru type people will still give this advice today. Uh, an alternative to this might be, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. The idea here is that we surround ourselves with people who are better than us, and uh, we will get better by proximity, uh, loosely. Uh, I speak from experience when I say that this works really well if you want to rapidly level up your own abilities, but it's also really exhausting because you're going to constantly feel like you're behind all your peers. Uh, it can work well, though, and we're going to explore a few unfortunate side effects of holding this belief about ourselves. Uh, as a beginner, we're not burdened by the curse of knowledge. We know what we know, we probably don't know some of what we know, and we definitely don't know what we don't know. Uh, we don't have years or even decades of historical context around any given decision or around any given problem. Uh, we look at it with completely fresh eyes and think of solutions completely unburdened from the shackles of reality. This can be a superpower if we're in an environment that'll let it flourish, uh, but it can also be a source of a great sense of shame and disappointment if we're in a toxic environment. I mean, if we're the dumbest people in the room, that would imply that we're the least valuable person in that room. And if we're the least valuable person in the room, then asking a question might just be a waste of everyone's time, right? I mean, they have years of experience. Surely they've already thought of whatever dumb thing that I wanted to ask. If we're the dumbest person in the room, then when someone else says something, they must know what they're talking about. Even if we don't understand it, it must be right, right? I mean, they're the authority, aren't they? But what if everyone feels this way? Uh, what if every one of us feels like we're the dumbest person in the room? Then we're all agreeing to whatever happens to be said, regardless of if it's right or not. We have created a bandwagon effect that just leads to worse decision making in the long run. I think it's important to remind yourself that you're not alone. If you have a question, there's a good chance that you're not the only person who has that question. Or maybe someone else had that question a few weeks ago and they can help answer it for you, which helps you and it helps them to reinforce what they learned. If we choose to not ask that question or to not attempt that new project or not commit to a project because we think we can't do it, we're engaging in a form of self-handicapping. If we stick to only doing the things we know we're good at and never attempting to do something that challenges us, that's self-handicapping. Self-handicapping can help preserve our self-esteem in the short term uh, by helping us to avoid perceived failures, but it can also hurt our confidence in the long term by preventing us from experiencing meaningful personal growth. 
Uh, when our minds are free of assumptions about how a system works, uh, how something should work, we're free to be curious and experiment. We're free to ask questions, we're free to try new things, we're free to experience growth and development. But we're also free to be wrong. And in fact, we're probably going to be wrong a lot. Uh, but being wrong isn't something we should fear. Being wrong helps us change the way we perceive the world, perceive the problems that we're facing, and helps us to overcome those problems. When I was in third grade, I did a report on Thomas Edison. Uh, I didn't know all the things I knew about him today, uh, but to a third grade nerd, he did seem like a good subject for a report on a historical figure. Uh, one quote, however apocryphal and paraphrased it might be, has stood with me ever since. Uh, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have not failed once. I have succeeded in proving those 10,000 ways will not work. This quote captures an essential reframing of the concept of failure, a uh, reframing of the concept of being wrong. Being wrong doesn't mean that we're not successful. Being wrong is not, it, it's just one stop on our journey to success. It's a great way to reinforce what's right once we eventually figure it out. There's uh, another concept in psychology called uh, the shared information bias, which basically suggests that a group of people will spend most of its time and energy talking about things that everybody already knows and spend very little time on the things that only a few people might know. Uh, this is an, has some interesting business impacts if we think about it. Like if you're having a meeting and you want to make sure that the right people are in the room because you want to make the right decisions, you want to reach some consensus and move the business forward. Uh, but in business, we don't really get the luxury of just sitting there and discussing the merits and shortcomings of every possible solution before we move forward. It also means that sometimes we're neglecting to make the best informed decisions. Uh, selecting the right people for a meeting is hard and relies on my understanding of what other people know, which is flawed. It leaves out people who might know a great solution but weren't included in the meeting or maybe they weren't on the email thread. I don't think there's a one clear solution to overcoming this tendency. It's going to be a game of balance because we can't just entertain every idea that everyone has before we make a decision. We can't invite everyone to every meeting. We could write documents and make them more widely available, but we can't ensure everyone's going to read it. And in fact, probably most people won't read it. So is there still value in writing it if no one ever reads it? Uh, if CrowdStrike crashes a Windows server in an airport and no one's around to take a picture of it, did it really happen? So if you're an individual contributor like me, you are probably more inclined to scoff at the idea of having to write down every proposed decision, the context, the consequences, et cetera, because uh, the more nuance that we understand about a problem, the more we realize that we will basically never stop writing if we try to do that. If you're a project manager, an executive, or someone who just really loves formal process, you're probably very excited by this idea though, and also very annoyed about people like me who won't follow your process. But we should definitely be thinking about how to overcome or rather counteract shared information bias, and if you have tools that you've used to help overcome this, I'd really like to hear about them after the talk out there. Uh, one amusing note I realized while writing this talk, uh, shared information bias would suggest that every person in this room already knows all the things that I'm talking about and that's why they're here because they wanted to hear more about the things that they already knew about. Uh, so to the people who ventured outside their comfort zone to be here, uh, I see you and I appreciate you. Switching gears, I want to talk to the more experienced folks in the room, uh, those of us who have put 10,000, 20,000 hours into our craft, uh, those of us who have forgotten how much we know uh, until we're randomly asked one day about some obscure problem and it all comes flooding back to us. As we grow in our field, we become more saturated with various biases. Even if we think we aren't biased or that we experience bias less than our coworkers, that's a bias in itself called the bias blind spot. We accumulate knowledge over the years and that knowledge helps us make informed decisions about our work. Uh, that accumulated knowledge is why we're so valuable, but it also represents a challenge for us as well. Was I ahead or behind? Okay, this is where I wanted to be. Nope. Well, this is where I'm going to be in a minute anyways. <laughs> Uh, if we've been in the same environment for most of our careers, whether that's the same job, uh, the same company, or the same role within the industry, we're likely to face the status quo bias or our tendency to prefer things stay the same because that's what we know. Who here loves Windows Vista, right? That's what I know. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we become burdened by the curse of knowledge. Contrary to the beginners who didn't have the knowledge, we do, and that makes it difficult for us to see perspectives of people who haven't been popping or patching shells for as long as we have. Even if those perspectives might be better than ours in some regards, we're probably going to have a hard time seeing it because of what our experiences have shown us. We also face confirmation bias, favoring the things that we're familiar with, uh, favoring the things that align with our pre-existing beliefs, and subcon subconsciously leading us away from things that challenge those beliefs. 
I think several of these biases help steer us towards decision making that makes it difficult for beginners to be heard. They help steer us towards the same decisions we've always made. They help steer us away from anything that challenges our status as an expert on a topic. But I think we have to make room for beginners. We have to actively encourage their participation, their confidence to ask questions, their sharing of ideas, their ability to approach problems in new and novel ways. Sometimes we have to let them fail. Because if we know their idea won't work and we tell them as much, they might not feel comfortable sharing those ideas with us again. We also have to lead by example. Sometimes if we know the answer to a question, it can be valuable for us to ask the question anyways. By actively making the, the decision to ask the questions that we think others might have, we are encouraging a culture where asking those questions doesn't feel so scary or overwhelming for others. We're helping to make sure everyone in the room has the same information and helping make sure that others are more comfortable speaking up when they have questions or concerns. Our mental models of how systems work are often biased by our experiences and by the knowledge that we already have. In any advanced system, whether that system's compri comprised of computers, of people, or some combination thereof, it's surprisingly easy for our mental models to quickly become inaccurate. By making a conscious active effort to free ourselves of the constraints of our own mental models, we can look at things in a new light and find interesting ways to improve them. We can think critically about the things that we otherwise take for granted. But making this effort is difficult. It requires going against every impulse our brain is telling us. It requires challenging ourselves at fundamental levels. But there are exercises we can engage in that help these challenges get easier and encourage us to more easily slip into this divergent way of thinking. In 2007, Sir Ken Robinson gave a TED talk that posed the questions of whether schools killed creativity or not. In that talk, he brings up this idea of divergent thinking, the concept of seeing a lot of ways to interpret a question, which opens up a lot of possible answers to the question. He gives one particular example that I've found myself using a lot uh, over the last 10 years or so. How many uses can you think of for a paperclip? Most people in this room might uh, come up with 10 or 15 people. Uh, most people will come up with like 10 or 15. People in this room are probably a little bit better at that, uh, you know, maybe 40 or 50 uses for a paperclip. Uh, but people who are really good at it, they might come up with 200 uses for a paperclip because they're going to challenge the, the very like, notion of the question. Uh, they're going to say, who said the paperclip was a conventional paperclip? What if it was 200 feet tall and made of rubber? Uh, suddenly, the uses for the paperclip can expand dramatically by just suspending our preconceived notions around what a paperclip is. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the essence of red teaming. Uh, I think red teaming has nothing to do with hacking computers, though that's the way that our industry has hijacked the term. Uh, the actual skill itself that makes someone a valuable red team member is their ability to think, to think divergently. Their ability to look at systems and problems and think, what if X was an X? What if it was A? Uh, when I got interviewed for my first red team job, one of the interviews revolved around a scenario in which I was an electrician. In front of me was a light hanging from the ceiling, and behind me is a light switch on the wall. The light's currently on, lists 10 ways to turn the light off, 10 components of a functioning light, and 10 ways to tell if the light is off, and finally, 10 ways to prevent someone from being able to turn the light off. Uh, this scenario originated from a document titled Jack of All Trades, which dates back to 2001, created by Pete Herzog, uh, its stated purpose is to teach security professionals to think outside the box and learn to use their knowledge in different ways. It puts people into scenarios that they're not likely to have a lot of experience in and then requires that they come up with answers based on those scenarios. I think this is a great example of an exercise that helps to develop our divergent thinking skills. Uh, it has formed the structure of uh, dozens of scenarios that I've used in the past, tailoring these questions to be more appealing to the audience. Uh, about six years ago, I was in visiting home and was asked to come speak at the local career tech center about my career in security. I had purple hair then, not quite as many tattoos as I do now, and I showed up in an all-black outfit with like this really long extra black hoodie. Uh, I looked kind of like I got trapped somewhere between a Hot Topic and The Matrix. Uh, I talked to the kids about my experiences in school, as well as experiences doing red team work for a large tech company. I got to demonstrate the perils of plugging in random USB devices, such as the USB rubber ducky, as well as the USB killer. Uh, to this day, I'm very grateful for the generosity of the class teacher who let me destroy an old machine with a USB drive just to show it could be done. Uh, I like to think that he also learned about the perils of picking up random flash drives that day. Uh, but I also used the opportunity to give a talk to the students about divergent thinking. I gave them a scenario not unlike the jack-of-all-trades electrician scenario, but more tailored to something that might resonate with them. You have a test next Friday. Does it say that on the screen? Cool. Uh, but the new Call of Duty also comes out that day. How do you get out of taking the test? How do you get your friends out of taking the test? How do you get the whole school out of taking the test? 
I gave the students a few minutes to jot down some answers to themselves and then asked for volunteers uh, to share some of their solutions. The initial answers were kind of boring. Uh, I'm going to try to convince the teacher. I'm going to stay home from school. I'm going like, to convince my parents I'm sick, that sort of thing. Um, and then one student broke the divergent thinking barrier and proposed that he would go around and break all the printers in the school because if the teacher couldn't print the tests out, then you wouldn't have to take it. Uh, that's when the floodgates opened. I think that uh, the kids started to feel more comfortable sharing their more creative ideas. Uh, one student said he would put raw fish in the HVAC system, crank the heat up, and break the knob off. I, brutal, but I appreciated it. Uh, another student said they'd cause a car accident to take out a power pole nearby the school the morning of the test. If the school had no power, they probably wouldn't have students come in that day. Once the barrier of the conventional was broken, the students probably came up with uh, four or five dozen ways to get out of taking the test, and I've never been so proud. Uh, so I wanted to actually take some ideas. How much time do I have left? Like three minutes? Three? Uh, does anybody have an idea for uh, how to turn the light off? Am I, am I 10 ways to turn the light off? Yeah. No, this one, okay. 10 ways to prevent someone from, or 10 ways to turn the light off. Anybody have an idea? What? Throw a, shoe Throw a shoe at the light, yes. Somebody said hit the breaker. Um, get a job at the electric company, become the boss of that electric company, and then shut down the whole power grid. That's what I like to hear. Uh, all right, on the flip side, uh, what about 10 ways to prevent someone from turning off the light? Any good ideas? Tie them to a chair. Tie them to a chair. Smallpox. Smallpox. That will do it. <laughs> Frame them for a crime and get them arrested. Yes, you cre yeah, create a guard. That, that's like the, the, the answer that I would have expected to hear first, uh, which proves that we're at a hacker convention. Uh, so uh, I wanted to give a special thanks. Uh, before I wrap things up, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Toby Kohlenberg, who taught me what it means to be on a red team and routinely encourages me uh, to challenge my own assumptions and ideas. Uh, Toby's the one who gave me the electrician scenario in the like originally and showed me the jack of all trades uh, questions and he offered me my first red team job. Uh, I'm really proud to consider him a mentor even if we don't really talk as much these days. Uh, I also wanted to give a special thanks to Kelly Shortridge who inspires me and who encouraged me to explore early ideas of this talk uh, as well as whose ideas have helped shape my own beliefs around security and challenging the status quo of the industry. Uh, challenging our own mental models plays a, a, like a, a key role in her book, Security Chaos Engineering, uh, which I highly recommend reading. So to wrap things up, uh, I hope this is what you take away. As an expert, go out of your way to ask questions that you think others might need to know the answer to, even if you already know the answer. Ask to clarify acronyms. Ask to clarify assumptions that people are making. You can lead by example and pave the way to a much more productive and informed team. As a beginner, be curious, be inquisitive, and don't be afraid to be wrong. If someone says something that you think is wrong, ask them to clarify. Don't assume that just because they have 20 years of experience uh, that they're automatically right. Seek to understand why they believe what they believe. Finally, and most crucially, uh, engage in divergent thinking. Challenge your assumptions, challenge your own beliefs, challenge your own mental models. This is how we become better, not only at our jobs, but as people. Thank you. right on time. Questions? Concerns? Does anybody have more creative ways to turn the light off or tell if the light is off or whatever? Yeah. Uh, yes, they make the PlayStation solar powered. Make it, make it bike powered so you have to exercise to play Call of Duty.